Good morning, everyone. Um, I think we'll get started. Um, we're just about on 10.30 now. So welcome to Engaging Audiences Through Crowdfunding, the fifth webinar in the Optimised Webinar Series on Online Marketing from Creative New Zealand. Thank you for joining us. I'm Vicky Alpress hill Director of the Audience Connection and Leader of the um, Online Marketing Capability Program Optimise. Um, I'm just reminding you all that you are on mute during the webinar. Um, and then you'll be taken off mute if you ask a question. Sabrina will do that for you. The background noise can be really distracting. If, if we see that someone's not muted, we'll let you know by private message, so keep an eye on the private message box. Um, the structure of the webinar um, will be the same as usual, but I'll let um, our presenter explain that to you. The first half, then a short break for questions, and then the second half, questions at the end. Um, if you do have a question, use the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, if a question occurs to you, just note it in that box as, as we go, or you can say that you have a question and then you can ask it in person. So last year we asked the arts community what topics they most would most like covered in the webinar series, and crowdfunding was a really popular choice. So many organisations and artists in New Zealand have been undertaking crowdfunding efforts in the last 12 months, with um, some of them with great degrees of success and some of them have struggled a little more. So crowdfunding is not just about the dollars, it's about building an audience, pre-marketing your project and engaging your supporters in more ways than just about funding. And nobody knows this better than Anna Gunther, the head of New Zealand crowdfunding platform PledgeMe, who has also completed her Masters in Entrepreneurship through Otago University with her thesis devoted to the concept of crowdfunding. So we're really delighted to have Anna here today as our guest presenter. Technically from Dunedin, Anna grew up in Boston in the US but is now calling New Zealand home. She's back here again. We're thrilled that Anna has brought with her also two other guest presenters, Carl from Dregs and Vanessa from Tattletale Saints, who have both um, crowdfunded, one for film and one for a music project. And they will each present a short case study, including what worked and what didn't, and valuable insights. And thank you so much, Carl and Vanessa, for joining us today and contributing your ideas and time. So over to you, Anna. Thanks, Vicki. Um, just to update everyone, actually, Carl was unable to make it. He has a really harsh deadline to do um, a edit a film today. <laughs> so it's just going to be me and um, Vanessa from Telltale Saints, but I'm sure that we'll be able to answer all the questions and give you a good insight into how crowdfunding works. So I'm just going to start the presentation by quickly telling you about uh, what we're going to cover today. So it's what is crowdfunding? So we're talking about the history today and some of the platforms that are out there. Um, we're going to then chat to Vanessa from Tattletale Saints about her project um, that she recently crowdfunded. Then we're going to have a quick question break, so do flick through any questions while you think of them, and we'll cover those during the break. And then we're going to go into top 10 and how to set up a project, um, followed by some final questions and a wrap-up. So my name's Anna Gunther, and I'm from PledgeMe. Um, my Twitter handle's in the presentation if you want to send any tweets while we're going as well. Um, but as Vicky said, I um, co-founded PledgeMe, which is one of New Zealand's crowdfunding platforms. And that came out of my master's thesis. So when I was um, back studying at Otago, uh, I had to pick a project. and It was everything but starting a business. And I had worked in grants administration before and also had been overseas and seen what Kickstarter was doing. So I thought it would be a really interesting idea to see, you know, how important is local crowdfunding and how would it work in New Zealand. So I devoted my entire thesis to looking into that and at the end of it decided that um, starting something like Pledge Me um, could be a goer and could be useful. And so um, we did that and it's been going very well since. So just to give you uh, start off with an inspirational quote because I like doing those. I think this really embodies the idea of what crowdfunding is. So some people dream of great accomplishments while others stay awake and do them. And I think that really embodies almost everyone in the creative scene as well because everyone's out there making things happen and creating things. And I think that the idea of crowdfunding really plays quite well into that because it gives you another tool with which to get your art and creativity out there. So what is crowdfunding? Crowdfunding um, stems from a term that was coined in 2006 by John Howe in Wired magazine. And he was the first man to use the term crowdsourcing. 
crowdsourcing was the idea that you could go out to your crowd to obtain solutions, feedback, or ideas. And it was specifically around the idea of stock photography. So um, in 2006, iStock Photos first came online. It was the idea that instead of spending thousands of dollars on stock photography, you could actually go out to your crowd and, and buy photos direct from them. Um, so crowdfunding came after that, and it was the idea that you could put a dollar goal around an idea and go out to your crowd to fund it and have a set deadline around it and some rewards. Uh, so the first crowdfunding platform that started was Celeband in 2006 and then Kickstarter in 2008, which is who we call the granddaddy of crowdfunding. So crowdfunding is a young industry. It's been around in its um, Kickstarter form since 2008. It's young not only in the terms of how long it's been around, but also in terms of the people that are using it. So this group on, on the presentation is a dance crew from Papakura Deception, and they wanted to go over to Sydney to the World Battleground Championships. And they weren't sure how they were going to fund it, so their dance teacher decided that maybe they should give this new thing called crowdfunding a go, and they did. And not only did they manage to make enough money to get all of the kids over to Sydney to compete, but they actually took home silver, which was really amazing. And also just that photo I thought really embodies the idea of crowdfunding, young, fierce. Um, but it's growing. So crowdfunding, um, as I said, started really in 2008. Um, in 2011, there were 170 crowdfunding platforms, and now there's over 450. Um, Kickstarter has had over $600 million pledged through their platform um, and 37,000 projects funded. Uh, Amanda Palmer, in, in the image on your screen, is one of the really well-known rock stars in the Kickstarter scene. She was signed with a label under, the, under her Dresden Dolls band and decided that she actually wanted to go on her own. She didn't really want to be with that label anymore, so she broke up with them and decided she was going to try to crowdfund her next album. And normally she'd have about $500,000 set aside to produce an album and um, promote it, but she decided she was going to try to do that for 100 k And so she went on Kickstarter and she set up her project, had an amazing video to go with it, and went out to her crowd. And she managed to hit over $1.2 million funded through 25,000 supporters. It was really interesting afterwards she reflected on that, and she realized that normally she would sell about 25,000 copies of her album. So in a way, this was engaging her crowd a lot earlier in, in the production process and actually giving her the runway to make the project the way that she wanted to. Um, she has had a bit of controversy since then around how she went about doing it, but she was one of the first million dollar projects on Kickstarter. And since then, there's been over 32. Um, locally, we're seeing that it's growing as well. Um, not only um, in our platform, but there are now other platforms around as well. But since launching officially in February 2012, we've raised over $1.2 million for creative projects in New Zealand through 17,000 pledgers. That's almost 300 projects funded. So it's, it's growing and it's growing fast. So this is Pledge Me. So as I was saying, it's growing. There's lots of different projects on there. It's everything from sort of the creative main three. So we see music, film, and art as being the top three sort of funded projects. But there's more coming through. So community projects um, and also some of the sort of science, tech, and education areas. Uh, really excited this morning. We had another project funded. It was Christchurch Boys Choir. They funded their trip up to Auckland. So again, it's a young industry, but growing. So here are some of the platforms that there are out there. So internationally and locally, internationally there's Kickstarter, as I've mentioned. Um, I'm going to quickly go through both of the, all of the platforms just to give you a little bit of idea about them, a little bit of more information about them, but also um, talk about their differences because there are some big differences between how platforms present themselves. So Kickstarter is, as I said, the granddaddy of crowdfunding, and they. Um, are an all or nothing platform. That means you need to meet your goal by your deadline or else your um, pledgers won't be charged and you won't receive the funds. Um, they only currently take projects from the United States and the UK um, and they're by far the biggest platform out there. Indiegogo is the, the next biggest. Um, Indiegogo uh, has a slightly different model though in that you can do the all or nothing um, 
or you can also do something called flexible funding, meaning you get to keep every dollar pledged. Um, there are some difficulties around that, though, because um, say you have a set goal that you need, you need $3,000 for the pre-production on your film or post-production. If you don't reach that goal, your pledges are still charged and they still are entitled to the rewards that they picked. Um, and that means that you might have to fulfill and finish a project even though you don't know that you have all the funding. Um, there are pros and cons to both. We definitely believe with Pledge Me that you need that sort of impetus and all or nothing because um, inherently the crowd can be a little bit lazy. So sometimes it's good to give them that impetus to give that time and deadline where they know that they have to become involved or else the project won't happen. Another international site that we see a lot of New Zealanders using is Pledge Music, um, which I think Vanessa might talk about a little later. And then locally, there's quite a few platforms as well. So we've got Give a Little. Give a Little is really more of a donation portal, but you can set up projects and people can donate directly to you. Um, there's Pledge Me, so we're also like Kickstarter, an all or nothing platform. You need to reach your goal by your deadline. And then there's also Boosted, who launched recently. And they're um, more of a patron of the arts model. People don't receive rewards for their pledges, um, but they do receive a tax credit. So one thing to think about when you're creating your project with whichever platform that you choose, your pledgers are going to be people you know and people in your community. So think about that. Think about the local attitude that you're going to take into your project. Um, I also just wanted to tell you a quick story about um, Waka in this image. Waka, um, was a high school student last year and he was spotted by a director and so he starred in a short film and the director asked Walker what he wanted to do next year and Walker didn't really know what he want, wanted to do and so the director decided he was going to crowdfund to cover Walker's cost to go to Miranda Har Harcourt's um, acting school and also cover the cost for him to travel there and so the director went up and he went out to his crowd and his community and just said, hey, this is, this is what I want to do. And they managed to fund that in just under 20 hours, which was pr pretty impressive, both with the speed with which it did it, but also the really local focus did matter. People could connect directly to that. It was walk out in Wainu Yamada, and they were helping him have a future. So now I would like to introduce you to Vanessa from Tattletale Saints. And Vanessa's going to talk about her project, um, why she decided to crowdfund what they did, also, what happened after? Hey, Vanessa. Hi. Um, yeah, so we um, we funded an album and recorded in Nashville, um, and that kind of came about by um, wanting to record an album, first of all, and, and trying to think of a great producer to work with. Um, Tim O'Brien is a, is a Grammy award-winning um, multi-instrumentalist and we just loved his work and sort of um, thought go for the biggest dream and ask the top and you know hopefully he would return our calls and luckily he did and he wanted to work with us so he um, he asked us to come to Nashville and um, and we thought that would be fantastic um, and the next thought was that it's going to be really expensive <laughs> so we um, we got a budget from him and and it actually ended up being comparable to recording at home and it was the opportunity of being able to go and work in a studio um, that he chose which coincidentally had been one that Johnny Cash had recorded at so it had a lot of um, a lot of cool aspects to going there um, and we drafted up a budget and it looks like we needed about 20,000 to go and get the album through to the master of the music so not um, not pressed and not publicized and not released but through to the to the actual um, completion of the, of the art artwork part of it, the art music part of it. Um, so we decided that, um, well crowdfunding had kind of in the last few years I guess, or maybe the last year had started to become much more common and I had personally um, pledged on a few campaigns for overseas artists that I liked that had come through that I'd um, pledged to get their album and so I felt I felt good about the process having been on the other side of it. and. Um, and we just decided to to crowdfund for this, um, largely because we had recorded an album as a different band in London and had taken out a loan to do so, and that was in 2009, and we're still paying it off now. So um, 
taking out personal loans to record an album is, is a very it's a financially very difficult um, way to do it. Um, and it, we're not we're an independent band, so a record label wasn't behind us, and the crowdfunding seemed like a financially uh, the way to do it. Um, and through doing it, I realised how how good it was also in terms of building a, a community around the project. Um, Anna, do you want me just to keep speaking, or are you going to ask questions, or what should I? Yeah, no, definitely keep speaking. I'll, I'll pop in when I type in when I have a question. Okay. And do I change the slides when it's time? Or Ooh, I can change it for you. I'll do that right okay. now. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So we so we decided to to go with um to, with Pledge Me. Uh, we did look at a few others, and and the reason we chose Pledge Me was um, Kickstarter, as Anna mentioned, is um, only for international, only for Americans. So unless you have a social security number, you can't use use it. Um, that was the first one that we looked at just because it was the most common, most popular. Um, we looked at Indiegogo as well. Um, I think fundamentally I didn't like the way it looked. I didn't like the way it was presenting the, um, the projects, which was sort of a gut reaction to it. But it was important that um, you know everything, everything around this project had to kind of fit together and it just didn't look like it was kind of us. It, we did look at the... Um, the prices, you know, there, there is a, a percentage taken um, by each company for the for the campaign at the end, um, and so we did compare that as well. Um, we looked at Pledge Music as well, and and we ended up deciding to go with Pledge Me um, because Pledge Me looked good and looked clean, and the design was nice, which I which I thought was important, but also because it was comparable to Pledge Music, it seemed in terms of fees. In fact, I think it was a little um, the fee was a little less, but we also liked the idea of working with a New Zealand-based company um, to support the New Zealand-based company, um, but also because we knew a lot of our pledges would be in New Zealand, and so we knew that they would probably be more likely to want to pledge if it was in New Zealand dollars and, um, and that if it was a, you know, a New Zealand website, which I think was true. Um, every other website, you couldn't turn it into New Zealand currency. You had to do it in US dollars. We looked at Uncle Percy too, which I think is another one which um, I, it's, I'm not sure. Uh, it's a smaller one and, and they, they couldn't do things like put videos up and things. They might be able to do that now, but we didn't go with them as well because we wanted to be able to do the video updates and we felt like that was an important part of it. Um, so the, the slide on the screen is, the, is, our, is our campaign. Um, our target was 20,000 and we... Um, had 226 pledges, as you can see. We raised over the target, which was really fantastic. Um, and yeah, and had 226 people on board supporting us. Um, how did you find, um, sort of who were the first pledgers on your project and how did you get the word out there once your project was set up? <laughs> the very first pledger, so it was um, secret at the time, was my mum. Um, which I think is is always often the case, um, mostly because you know mums and, and dads are the first people that you usually tell that you've put the project online. <laughs> um, so my mum got it started, which was very kind of her. And then what we did is we we strategically rolled it out through um, first of all through family, then friends, um, then we went to the bands fan base through our mailing list and Facebook and Twitter, and then we went to public. So we did that because we wanted it to be um, appealing to everyone, and as it built through those levels, it meant that each new burst of people, as they saw it, could see that the campaign was already successful. So going to our families first was a good way of just getting it jump-started, and then friends got on board, and we, we said to people, you know, we want to get this going before we launch it to the public. So if you're, gonna, if you're going to get on board, can you do it now? Um, and so by the time we took it to our fan base, um, it was already kind of rolling, had a few thousand dollars happening on it, and then the fan base really got on board, and, and then we did take it public through, um, through we had an article in the paper, we had some, some contacts in the press that we, that we got on board with, and, and the fact that we were going to record in Nashville, I think, with a, with a really great producer, meant that they were um, interested in, in talking about it because it was an exciting project. Um, that's kind of the next slide as well, talking about the rollout of it um, and how that how we kind of we had bookmarks which we um, sent we, we took around and we did sort of grassroots handing information out to people. So a lot of our um, fan base because we play we play kind of country folk and um, our fan base is quite diverse in age, but a lot of people that we knew would support the project weren't on Facebook or Twitter. So being able to give them a bookmark that said it had a you know an image of us and it talked about the 
what we were doing and it gave the website for how to go and pledge. So people then went and did it, um, people that we wouldn't have been able to reach otherwise. So we tried to cover all bases of, of getting the information out there to people. Can, can um, you um, just quickly talk about um, Sai and the bookmarks? About Sai? I remember um, when you were telling me about the bookmarks, you were quite excited that um, because it sort of gave Sai a role that he'd never had before. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. Um, because Sai is the is the primary songwriter in our band, so his role is usually writing the the songs, and I tend to organise everything. But he um, he also does design, and and he designs the bookmarks, and and took great pride in making them beautiful. <laughs> um, he was he yeah he finds the design part frustrating because he's a musician and not a designer, but he does also like everything to be. Um, we wanted the art throughout this whole project, whether it was the bookmark through to the actual artwork on the front cover of the CD, we wanted everything to be um, a piece of art in its own right, so not just sort of thrown together. I, I think the thing that I thought was really interesting was sort of the engaging with the audience, though, with the bookmarks. It was something, you know, normally you were out there promoting the band, but having this bookmark sort of gave Sai the legitimacy to go and start talking to the fans about what you guys were doing and getting them on board and getting them excited. And... Um, yeah, and it meant that you had a reason to go up to people at a gig and say, "Hey, I've got a would you yeah, like a bookmark?" Cool. and and people tend to say yes to a free something, <laughs> no matter what it is. Yeah, and um, when you were setting up your project, sorry, I've already clicked past that slide, but is there any sort of tips and tricks that you'd want to give people now about how to set it up or what to include or around selecting rewards? Yeah, I think I think um, you want to make your video as as good as you can. Um, in terms of, um, you know, not everyone has access to, to really high quality recording equipment, but do do the best you can, especially if your project, for us, we wanted to make it sound and look good, because especially the sound, we thought, well, we're a music project, so sound is important to us. So we, we recorded um, the video with a, a good camera, which we were borrowing at the time from a friend, and we t recorded the audio with our music audio equipment so that it would sound clear and good and wouldn't sound hissy. Um, so we took a lot of time to make, we actually recorded the, the initial um, pledge campaign video. We recorded it about five times um, because we just decided it wasn't good enough every time. And, and we knew that it was the first thing that people were going to see. And probably within 10 seconds, a lot of people, if they, if they weren't, you know, if they'd stumbled upon it, they would have, they would have left it again if they weren't impressed. So we took some time to, to make it good. And um, we thought that it was important to really be clear with people what exactly we were going to do. Um, and the time frame and how the money would be spent so that there was no ambiguity about what we would be doing with the money, knowing that people, you know, money is, is tight for people and if they were going to support us, they needed to know that it was, it was truly going to be worth it. Um, and the rewards, we decided to include, we had the obvious rewards of, of the MP3 download and we had CDs, of course, um, but we also decided through, through research we'd done um, looking at um, other crowdfunding projects and, and information about crowdfunding just tried to make it as personal to us as possible um, because people are interested in in you as people as well as your as your project that's why they're often there because they, they know you or they're interested in some way so we tried to include rewards like um, well we did things like we had a writer's pack which included um, Tattletale Saints branded um, notebook pencil bookmark um, a bag of coffee um, and a CD. So we had a writer's pack, which were things that we kind of liked, and we had um, we had house concerts, of course, which is quite common for, for bands. And we had a, a go for a run with Sai, because Sai is a runner. Um, and someone did, did anyone actually buy that? that? Yeah, one person did actually buy that, <laughs> um, which was really amusing. We were we were waiting um, with bated breath the whole time, waiting for someone to pick that reward, not thinking that anyone ever would, <laughs> and someone finally did. Um, but yeah, we, we had a hip flask, um, which, you know, in the slide on the screen, size holding up, this is one of our video updates, which we did. We did a lot of video updates, we did about six or seven um, throughout the process, so that people could see that we were engaging with them, and that we were, we were trying to not just take their money, but actually create a, um, a sort of sense of camaraderie between us and the people who were getting on board with our project. Um, oh, I put the, the, the Nashville postcard there because um, the funny thing, we, we put send, that we would send you a postcard from Nashville. That was one of the rewards. And um, we kind of just did it last minute because we thought it would be fun. And we were so surprised by how many people wanted that. <laughs> we ended up having to spend about four hours in Nashville writing postcards. <laughs> um, 
but it was a cool reward and it was it was not a hugely expensive one but it was it wasn't expensive for us to to do except for the time but it was a fun one because it meant that you know i guess people knew that we'd gone to a hon- down by the honky tonks and gone to a tourist shop and bought a postcard and, <laughs> and sent it off so i put that there because it was an unexpected success on the rewards <laughs> any any um sort of uh pitfalls or things that you'd warn people about or get them to think about earlier on yeah well one of the things that i found really hard was was trying to factor in the the cost of postage um for all the rewards because um not that it was hard to figure out how much it would cost to post something with the weight you could kind of guess that but it was really hard to know where people would pledge from and we ended up having um probably because we had been based in london and i'd lived in the states for a couple of years so we did have people and and friends around the world and and we sold quite a few cds to the uk and to australia and to the states and and um the the cd the cost of posting a cd to the uk ended up being 13 dollars and the cost of the reward was 25 for a cd so when you include the cost of actually making the cd and then posting it it ends up being that the ones that went to the uk were kind of almost like didn't end up with any profit at all um which is which is still fine because it you know balances out I'm sure with other postage but that was quite a hard thing to to suss out and I would probably um, maybe in the future it would have been good to have an option where if the person was overseas perhaps there could have been a different reward option to include a little bit more postage or something but that was um, that was something that I found hard and also because we didn't know how many of each reward people would choose so if if a lot of people had chosen the rewards with a big heavy box full of merchandise but less people had chosen cds then that would have ended up harder too but i guess that's something that you don't really know until you do it and i guess if we did another pledge campaign i would know better for us but i think postage was the only thing that was a hard thing to to quantify ahead of time cool next slide yeah so this is just a little montage of of some photos of, of Nashville. Um, down in the left hand corner is, is Tim O'Brien, who is the producer, and me. And we're at the Grand Ole Opry, which was a fantastic night. <laughs> um, top corner on the left is is the three of us with Ferg, who is our sound engineer. Um, and then we've got Sai recording some vocals with some um, toilet paper wrapped around the microphone to eliminate some kind of hiss or something that was going on. Um, and then, yeah, in the centre is, is the CD cover. We um, that was the completed album, and and we managed to complete it pretty much to schedule. We had promised the pledges that we wanted to get it to them ahead of time. That was part of the the perk of helping us make it was that they would get it before the media and before the public. Um, so the release date was March 29th this year, and the pledges got it towards the end of February, which I um I wanted them to get it in February, and and I was really i mean it was there was times where that looked unlikely but i was really committed to it because i felt like um not fulfilling that part of it was like going back on what we'd said we would do for them and i felt like with that many people that had that had helped us make it happen i didn't want to do that so so we fulfilled the rewards um in february and then we went on tour in april um and released the album around the country and and getting to go around the country and, and actually meet a lot of um, the people that had pledged was so fantastic and, and, and was an unexpected little bonus that I, I hadn't really thought about getting to, I sat down in, in Gisborne, we had a, a concert with one of the people who had pledged um, for the album credit. So he had given us, I think it was $500 and that meant that he got his name in our album in the liner notes. And and in the break from my concert, I was sitting in the bar and, and he came up and introduced himself. and. And it was so it was so nice to be able to say in person to him, you know, thank you so much. You you made a, a huge difference to us being able to go and make this album. And we had that at a lot of the, the gigs. We got to meet people that had either pledged, you know, for for concert tickets or for CDs or or anything. And people would come up and and say that they'd been following the the, the process and and following the videos from Nashville. And it was awesome. It was I think the crowdfunding the side of crowdfunding that I didn't expect. Um, was the community part that it created around the project and and that was a really um, it was an amazing part that it had originally the, the whole idea was kind of just a, a way to financially make this project happen but you know we've we've managed to pull on board a whole lot more awesome people <laughs> into our into our little kind of tattletale things world so it was really good awesome I think that is great. Maybe we should head over to questions now, which I'll let Vicky 
um, facilitate. Thank you, Martha. Well, Vanessa, just, this is Vicky here. I just have to thank you so much for so generously sharing your case study. I think hearing the real practical advice, um, what you went through, how you planned the campaign, the kind of thinking behind it, and then the outcomes is just really useful to us all. Um, hmm. I found it really interesting to hear some of your the important elements, like um, you know how how important the video was and how important it is to fulfill the rewards. And also I found really interesting how you jump started it with those close sort of family, friends and fans before you went out to the public. That's really great. Mm. Um, there's, I don't have any questions yet from participants, but feel free to jump, drop them in the Q&A. But I just wanted to ask you myself, um, you talked about you know one of the surprise outcomes was a community created around the project. Um, how have you retained connections and engagement with that community once the project ended? Have you have you kept in touch with those people? Um, are you planning to sort of go out to them again? Any thoughts on that? Um, well, we kind of we toured um, the album just we just finished the tour a few weeks ago. So in some ways, I kind of feel like the project has just ended because um, it was creating the album, it was funding the album, going to Nashville, finishing the album, promoting the album, and then touring it. It was kind of a one big project. So um, we haven't done anything. Well, well, we we've we kept in touch with them through um, through the the uh, videos that we made. We made videos in Nashville. Um, which we sent out to the pledges. We, we haven't on our mailing list. We have a, um, a, set, a separate block of email addresses, which is the people who pledge. So we could specifically send things to them. Um, and so we kept in touch by doing video updates. And then when we came back, we sent email updates to say what was happening with it. Again, because I felt like it was really important to keep them up to date. I had actually pledged on a campaign myself in the states, and mm -hmm. it just sort of vanished off the radar for eight months. And then a CD arrived, and I kind of thought it would have been nice to know what was going on just because, you know, not because I didn't think it was going to come eventually, but I felt like it was good to keep in touch with them just to keep them informed. And, and when I felt like there was going to be a delay with sending it out, we sent out the MP3 download at the very beginning of February and said, you know, here's the album. You will obviously get your reward as well, but that's going to be in a couple of weeks and here's why it's got delayed and, you know, we're, we're sorry, but, but it's coming. Um, and, and yeah, I guess what we probably will do, I mean, we, we were able to make this project happen and raise so much money, I think, because we already had a pretty strong fan base. I don't think, I don't think crowdfunding is a, is a magic wand that you can just wave over a project. I think you have to work it to make it work for yourself. Um, and it worked for us because we, all, we had already toured twice in New Zealand. We had already played, um, you know, a number of festivals and, and, and we had kind of started to build a, a following on the ground that then as long as we could reach out to them as long as they could find out about the project, they did, they did get on board. So I guess the same thing now with these new people is that we would hope to retain them through, through the mailing list and through. I mean, we met a lot of them on tour, and so I'm sure that has helped to consolidate their interest in us. And I guess it's the yeah the same thing, just trying to. I mean, with a with a band, I guess you're always just trying to keep people interested, but not annoy them with too much. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's great. Um, I've got a couple of additional questions coming now. They're probably probably more for Anna, but feel free to chime in, Vanessa, if they're for you as well. Um, the first one that came in from Celia Jenkins: Does Pledge Me provide to the project contact details of all who've donated? So, is it an opt-in or opt-out? So, so I think what what Celia's saying is, um, does the project get the contact details of the um, everyone who's donated? Yep. So. Um most crowdfunding platforms give you a list, and we do too. So at the end of the project, if you're successful, you get a full list of everyone who's pledged and what they've picked in their and their email addresses. The only um, uh, the only time you wouldn't get their information um, after the project ends and you're successful would be if they pledged anonymously. And so that's someone who says, I don't want a reward. I don't want you to even know who I am. I just want to give you 50 bucks. And that actually does happen quite a bit. Um, but you no, know, there is a full list, which is totally owned by the project creator themselves. Um, and that is that is your crowd and your audience and, and you can build build from there. Um, yeah. Right. Did you um Vanessa, did you have many anonymous pledgers on your um pledger? Um we had a, a couple. We didn't we didn't have 
Well, we didn't have that many. We actually had quite a few people that selected no reward, which some of them, um, two of them emailed afterwards and said that was an accident. We actually do want a CD. Um, but we had a few that said no reward. But yeah, we only, we only had a couple, maybe like two anonymous, which out of 220 odd people, that's quite small. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I have another question from Debbie Crackett in the in the South Island. Um, could you use crowdfunding for capital expenses for a venue such as lighting rigs and work rewards around the venue? Any ideas about that, Anna? Yep, so you, you definitely can. Uh, we actually, one of our biggest projects uh, was the basement up in Auckland and they crowdfunded to renovate, their, uh, to renovate their foyer and also put some more soundproofing into their venue. Um, and they they really worked the rewards from the venue. They did an amazing job. Um, it was everything from sort of uh, street art created by some of their patrons through to um, the woman on the reception desk would write you haiku poems specifically for you. So um, there there are definitely ways to do that. And that it's it's just when you have a project, it can be anything, but it has to be a specific project with a with a sort of start and end date. Sure. Um, just a couple more questions and then I think we'll let you move on, Anna, because I think um, possibly the, the next question here is from, which is from Delia from Sounds, um, is possibly this question will be answered by your next section. Um, are there any recognised common rookie mistakes, such as non-successful attempts, rewards or approaches? Do you want to cover that in your next section or do you want to answer that now? We'll cover that in the tips section maybe and then if there's anything else at the end, um, sure. I can in the next Q&A. I've got another question from Debbie, but it's quite a specific one, so I think we might just leave that till the end and let you carry on for now, if it's okay, Debbie. And um, if you have any further questions around for Vanessa, they can come at the end as well. So I'll, I'll let you move on. Cool. Um, so next up is some tips, and these are you know tips that are useful not just for crowdfunding projects. Some of them are just useful in general. Um, so just bear with me if there are things you already know. Um, the first tip is to keep it clear. Um, your, your crowd of family, friends, and fans, they love you, they want to see what you're doing, but if they can't understand it, they, they don't know what they're giving towards. So make sure that they understand what the project is, what the money is going towards, um, who's behind the project, and also how, you know, what they're doing is making a difference. Um, making sure you have a mix of, of um, wording and, and photos is quite good. So having images, sometimes that helps explain more and break up the text. But the attention span of the normal online user is quite small. So keeping it clear is key. Uh, next tip is a crowd brings a, brings a crowd. And I, I think Vanessa already sort of talked to this, but um, this is images of a group that crowdfunded through us. And I thought that they were a really good example. So eight girls in a band called St. Rupertsburg. So there's eight of them. So they already had eight mothers, eight boyfriends, eight everything. So they were, they were a big crowd in themselves and they managed to crowdfund their album really quickly because of that. All of them were going out there and they were sort of building out from their network. Um, so having a crowd brings a crowd and getting that first base of people around your project is really important. Um, I was going to show a video, but I think we might not have time. So if people want to go to the link next, uh, it is on that screen. I can send it through as well. But um, there's a really great TED Talk, and it's just a three-minute TED Talk by a man named Derek Sivers, and his TED Talk is How to Create a Movement. And there's this one quote, which is up there, um, that really um, got to me. It really explained the idea of crowdfunding. And it's the, you know, the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. And so that first Pleasure, which is often your mother, um, is really important and plays an important role to sort of validate what you're doing um, and get everyone else on board. We also um, we did something recently. Um, we went up to Auckland and organized a flash funding mob. So we wanted to show what um, what crowdfunding was in real life. And so what we did was we we got a thousand dollars and we got a flash mob through Twitter. So we went to our followers on Twitter and um, individually invited 100 of them to come along to partake in a flash mob, and we didn't tell them what it was. And then we went to the streets of Auckland and we found a busking family. And within five minutes, we had flash mobbed this busking family with $1,000 worth of coins. 
And in the end, they actually made $1,400, and our crowd of 30 people that had come along actually turned into a crowd of 70. So it was the idea that, you know, people walking along wanted to get involved because they saw this crowd around this group busking. Um, and also people felt like they wanted to get involved and actually give money, so they made almost half again what we'd brought along in five minutes. So that was a really good visual um, explanation of how it works, and there's a video link to that as well that I can send around. So next tip is it's a journey. It's not all about the money. And if you just go out asking for money, um, you might actually annoy your crowd. So making sure that it's actually a conversation and people are feeling like they're part of your project and they're part of the end goal. And when you go out, it's not just asking. You might be going out telling them things, giving them new information, talking about your project. And I thought that one of our projects did this really well. It was a woman who was going over to um, perform in a cabaret show and, and um, take some lessons in the UK. And so every day she went up on her Facebook and put up another picture of her outfit that she was thinking about wearing and actually engaged her crowd in deciding what she should wear. So it was a subtle way to keep on going out and talking about her project and giving people the link, but it was also getting them involved in actually, you know, what is she going to wear when she's performing on stage? And I think she chose the number on the right, the red dress. Um, Next up, being open to change. You know, you might go up and say that you want to create a project and it's going to fund X, but your crowd might come back and say that they really want you to fund Y. Uh, that happened with this group, Road to Ruin. They decided that they needed some money to cover their um, sound recording costs. They wanted to get a voiceover artist in to, to do the voiceover work on their documentary about the most tattooed woman in New Zealand. And uh, through the campaign, they kept on getting feedback from their crowd saying, actually, the voiceover work that you did on your pitch video was amazing. You shouldn't spend your money on that. And so they decided that they wouldn't. They met their goal and afterwards ended up doubling the length of their documentary and doing the voiceover work themselves because they'd had such clear feedback from their crowd that that was what they should spend their money on. Saying thanks is really important as well. Um, making sure that your sort of attitude of gratitude is constantly out there and you're, you're telling people that what they're doing is making a difference and that it's really important to, to making the project happen. Um, one crowd funder did this really well. She went out um, with pictures, hand-drawn notes to her crowd, her, to her pleasure saying thanks during the campaign, which I thought was a very well done personal way to connect with her pleasures. Tip number six is that rewards are rewarding. Um, we, we think that creating a value exchange around what you're doing really supports people to give. They, and it doesn't need to be something that costs a lot of money or something that needs to be shipped internationally. It can just be something as small or as simple as um, drawing someone's name in the snow and sending them a picture of that. We actually had a group do that. Um, a man went over to um, Sweden for his art exhibition, and he said if people pledged $20, he'd send them a picture of their name in the snow. And so there's a picture of 50 people's names in the snow, or lots of different pictures, that um, he ended up sending out afterwards. And all it took was time, but it was something that engaged people around the project and gave them some value in return for giving. Um, and also bearing in mind around the rewards that you should have a few different tiers around, um, around what it is, and, and do know that probably about 10% of your pledges will pledge for no reward. But keeping in mind, you know, the average pledge is around $20, um, or the most often pledge amount, sorry, is $20, whereas the average amount is actually 70. So having something around the $20 mark, around the $70 mark, around the $100 mark, and then having some large rewards as well. Um, we've had a few people do things like dinner parties and private concerts and private shows. So figuring out different things and things not only that relate to your project, but sometimes they can just relate to you. If you're really good at baking cake, cake always goes down a treat. So figuring out different things and different things that your team can do um, around that. Next up is being a little crazy. So this isn't a grant application. This isn't um, filling out a form. This is showing people what you're doing and getting them really engaged in what you're doing, really excited and really interested and in having lots of visuals and being a little different is really important, making them remember who you are and what you're doing. Um, we had a group that came through us and they were crazy. They were a band called Mango and Grouse and they had interesting rewards like, you know, for, for 100 bucks they would write a song about your life or your death. Um, but for $1,000, they would create a religion based around you. 
and someone pledged that. So having quirky different ideas and different ways of putting your project out there will make people remember you and um, are definitely will definitely help you be more successful. Tip number eight is it's about you as much as your project and I thought that this this community did this very well. They, um, they're from Blueskin Bay and they were have a wind turbine and they decided they wanted to crowdfund to build a measurement tower next to it which sounds a little bit weird and they through their project really explained who they were as a community and who who the people behind the project were not only did they explain who they were though and get people to connect through the people in the project but they actually went out to their community and said hey if you don't have any money to give to this project that's totally fine is there anything that you could actually give yourselves to the project though and so they crowdsourced, in essence, um, support for the project and uh, rewards. So they had people offering to give unicycle lessons and blues lessons, and um, one woman for $15 would home kill your chicken for you. So it's, it's making the project more than just the project, but the people around it, and explaining who you are, but getting people involved um, in different ways. Tip number nine is that a video really is worth a million words. Um, people have very short attention spans, as we all know, and having a video up there that shows who you are uh, and shows what the project is, is very important. Um, this is actually a video that I often show uh, that the, this picture is from. It's one of the groups that crowdfunded through us, they're, uh, they're filmmakers, and they, they had originally made this pitch video, which was okay. It wasn't amazing, but it was them sitting on a couch explaining their project and, and showing on the back of the couch sort of what, what they wanted, what they were crowdfunding for. And, you know, they're, they're, they were doing pretty well with their project, but then one of their friends slapped them upside the, set, upside the head and said, hey, you can do way better. You're filmmakers. Um, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to film. And uh, over, over a day, they actually created a new video that um, really explained why they made the money, who they were, showed clips from their footage, it showed clips of the director and the producer, and it also sort of gave the top nine reasons why people should pledge. And within a day after that, I believe, they'd actually met their goal because the new video was so engaging and so um, so much about who they were and what the project was that people, people um, trusted them believed in what they were doing and, and wanted to give. So having a video is really important. And I, it doesn't mean that it has to be flashy or, you know, you have to pay money to get it created. I've seen multiple videos come through uh, that people's children have made. So eight-year-olds are actually really good video editors. So, you know, just figuring out how, um, what support you have in house for what you're creating, but also just bearing in mind that putting a, a an, face and also a voice to what you're doing and having a video is very important. Last tip um, is that it's not just about the money. So people might not be able to give um, funding, but they can, you know, support you by sharing your story and sharing your project. But also they might get back in touch and give you things. Um, so I sort of already mentioned that earlier, but one project that we had come through was a woman creating a manual for doing yoga in prisons. Um, which is a quirky, but she, she just needed the money to print this manual that she'd created to teach people how to teach yoga in prisons. And she met her funding goal and exceeded it, but she also start, started to get uh, yoga mats from all around the country. So people started donating her yoga mats to use. So bearing in mind, it's not just about the money. And when you're, all of those tips should help you with setting up your project, but really you just need to jump into it and go and figure out if it's something that you want to do. If so, picking a platform and then just making sure that your pitch is clear. You have a good description, you have a video, and you have some rewards. And don't be scared if it sounds like a lot to figure out. There is planning to it, but it's something that can grow and change as you go. So if you want to add new rewards while you have a project going, you can. If you want to change the text, you can. It's an it's a evolving process, and it's a process that should really involve your crowd as early as possible, asking them what they'd want, getting them involved in creating things, and, and figuring out where to from there. So I think now, one more quote, attitudes are contagious, is yours worth catching? Um, but now we're ready for questions. So Anna, it's Becky here. Um, Wow, thank you. Those tips are invaluable. Um, 
I know at the digital marketing workshops that we held earlier this year, crowdfunding was a burning question. We had a lot of questions that I think you've, you've answered in your tips. Um, so, you know, thank you. That's, I've got a number of questions, but there's also a few sort of stacking up here. Um, so we've got a great 10 minutes for questions, which is wonderful. Um, so just a reminder, you can type your question into the Q&A box, um, but you can also say, I have a question, and, and, and we'll take you off mute, and you can actually ask it uh, as a voice question if you would prefer. So as, as we're going through these questions, feel, feel free to add yours into, into the Q&A box. So we had a question earlier from Fiona Douglas, which um, Vanessa has kindly answered by text, but I think I'll I'll read it out. Please can you reiterate your most successful reward? And I, I think that was probably for Vanessa, but um, you may also like to chime in, Anna, once Vanessa's answered. Yeah, I think she also just clarified that um, she wanted to know what the quirky reward was. <laughs> um, but the most popular reward was the CD, which makes sense because we were going to record an album. So um, the most um, the most pledged one was either the CD or the signed CD, or we also offered a pack of three CDs so that you could give them away as well. Um, but I think the most the quirky reward that we mentioned was the going for a run with Psy, um, which yeah was probably the more off the wall one out of all of the rewards. Um, but yeah, the, the, the CD was the most, most commonly chosen. And Anna, what have you found have been um, successful rewards, the most commonly successful ones? Um, the most com commonly successful are the sort of tangible outputs of what you're doing. So if you're mu a musician, it's your album. If you're a filmmaker, it's a copy of the film. If you're a comic artist, it's a copy of the comic book. It, it, it often is the thing that you're creating that people want. But, um, yeah, quirky rewards that we've had range from, yeah, creating religion through to um, writing someone's name in the snow. You know, there's, there's different ways to different ways yeah. to go around them. There's some great ideas for rewards amongst your tips. Um, <laughs> lucky I had mute on because I was snorting with laughter at <laughs> the, the chicken and the religion thing. But um, we have a question here from Peter Duplessis, which is a question that I was actually interested in too, um, which is, do you not perhaps think that crowdfunding has reached its peak and that fatigue has perhaps started to creep in? It's interesting because I've gotten that from a few people, and both in New Zealand and internationally, it's still growing. And I think the the thing that people are fatigued about is um, people asking for money for nothing. So when there's no rewards around or people can't see the actual um, benefit, but it is growing. Um, our average week of pledges was around thirty thousand dollars, and last week we hit sixty-two thousand. So it's it's definitely increasing and looking at Kickstarter as well. But I think the thing that people need to think about now is not it's not this new thing. It's a tool and it's a tool that needs to be used well and it's it's a tool that people need to um, people need to understand. It's not recreating um, a donation portal. It's not donating. It's actually um, creating engagement with your crowd. Okay, thanks. Can I um, have that too? Yeah. Please. Um, just, I was, I was going to say that I've had a lot of friends talking t with me about this recently because we did a successful project and obviously, therefore, I had some good advice for them. But, you know, I've had the exact conversation saying, is, has it not reached its peak and now it's just an, an annoying thing that everyone's talking about? And I don't think that's true. I definitely think it's reached a point now where it's, it's no longer a new thing and most people know what it means when you say crowdfunding, which a year ago probably wasn't the case. Um, but I totally agree with Anna that it's it's a tool. It's not a it's not a it's not a thing. You can't create a project and then hope that it will just make itself happen. It's a way to create um, funding and, and community around a project. And I think that I've been advising a friends band a little bit about their upcoming project. And and really, it you, you have to think of it as a as a something that you can make work for yourself rather than something that I think maybe a year ago it was enough to say, hey, we're crowdfunding, isn't that exciting? But now it's like, that's not exciting anymore because everyone's done it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I guess the project has to be really genuine and not just forced to get funding. It has to be something yeah. that you're genuinely planning. And people have to be able to see that it's, it's worth them being involved, that it's not just about the person that's creating the project, it's about making it good for everyone involved, otherwise people just won't be. Yeah. Okay, so we have a question here from Anna Herman for you, Anna. How many projects do not reach their targets? That's question. a really good question, and it's something that I normally actually talk about in my presentation, but I've taken out my stats screen. 
But um, our success rate is 48%, so that is on par, it's slightly higher than some of the international sites. Um, but it's really interesting because people often come back and say, well, isn't that bad? You know, there's still 52% of people that don't get funded. And it's not always the case, you know, it is people come back and try again and get funded. But I think it's interesting to look at as a conversation as well, you know, people seeing if something's going to work and just testing an idea. Um, it's also double the success rate of um, some of the grant systems out there. So it's it's another way, but it's not the only way. I'm just, I haven't forgotten everyone else's questions, but I just want to throw one in here that relates to that and came up quite strongly at the digital marketing workshops, which is what do you do when you've launched your crowdfunding project and it's out there and it's not working? How do you handle that? Do you have any tips for that? Um, so I think that, that my sort of last quick point before we ended was it's not over till it's over. You can always change your project while it's running. You can add new rewards. You can add a new video. You know, you can change the description. It's taking that feedback from the crowd. If it's not working, figuring out new ways of um, invigorating it. And sometimes it is a case of going back again. So sometimes it's, it might be the, the project that you're funding wasn't pitched in the right way and you need to repitch it. Okay. And um, Debbie had an, the question earlier was quite specific, which was to your platform, which is if your project isn't successful, do you still pay the, the fee, the success mm -hmm. fee? Um, no. So the success fee um, is 5%. Someone else asked that um, directly to me. It's a 5% it's a success fee on our platform, and it's only charged if the project is successful and the pledges are processed. Um, success fees generally range between 5 to 15%, um, depending on the platform. Um, and then there's credit card fees around that as well. Okay. So um, earlier Delia asked about common rookie mistakes. I just might revisit that. So of those, you know, those 52% that aren't successful, what would you say was the common um, things that they're doing that are just are not, are making them not work? Um, not having a clear, clear and um, well thought out pitch about what the project is and and describing it so your crowd can engage with it is one really important um, thing to bear in mind. Also not overvaluing the rewards, making sure the rewards are something that um, people see the value in giving now and supporting now and um, engaging with. I think okay. just planning, planning it well and getting it ready and getting it out there and getting your crowd involved as early as possible. A lot of people do, um, do projects it, and also, if you're quite new to it and you don't already have a fan base, you need to bear in mind that going for a lower amount is probably in order. So the average project, average successful project is around $3,000. That said, you know, we've had projects like Vanessa that, that has raised 20000 We have a project at the moment that has over $50,000 pledged to it. So you can go higher, but if you're new to it and if you've got a smaller fan base to start with, aiming a little bit lower. Sure. Um, in response to your earlier comment about everyone knows about crowdfunding, etc., Debbie, Debbie Cracker has said actually not everyone has heard about it. I didn't know about it. So there are areas in New Zealand that don't know. It's interesting. It's so. really interesting the amount of people that come back um, who haven't heard of crowdfunding, but also the things that people say, like cloud funding. Is it something up in the cloud? Um, <laughs> it's, it's definitely an educational area in New Zealand. So getting people understanding what it is and how it works well. Yeah. Um, I have a, another question which is around how you would, any clever ways or even just the most important basic ways that you should utilise social media channels to um, integrate and align with and support your crowdfunding ex um, exercise? So our website is quite, quite integrated with Facebook and Twitter and all of that. and using those as sort of a conversation around what you're doing. So making sure it's not the constant pitch, it's not the constant, hey guys, give me money, but making sure it's a conversation. So, you know, telling people what you've done, telling people there's a new reward, um, telling people who the first person that pledged on your project was, making it sort of interesting and relevant and promoting that through your networks um, is really key. I also think making sure there's lots of images around it. So if you're using, um, especially on Facebook, but also on Twitter as well, getting some good images of you and the team and what you're doing while you're working towards getting your project up or, you know, this is a picture of the reward that we've just gotten or 
really engaging and, and, and making it a conversation with your crowd. Mm. I think it's important. Vanessa, do you have any tips from your end on how you use social media? Um, I think it's probably true to be careful that you don't overuse social media rather, you know, it's, it's often easy to really overdo it. Um, and in the moment that someone gets sick of hearing from you is, is usually when, you know, you've lost them forever. <laughs> um, so I suppose, yeah, just keeping, we tried to do um, weekly updates. We, I think our project ran, ran for 60 days, so two months, and we chose that length of time because I had quite a extended plan for how we were going to roll it out to the different levels of people. So, um, but yeah, we just tried to make sure that once a week we did a video that was interesting and short, but you know, um, fun showing, we had a video where we showed the hip flask that we'd got the, tent, the, the, the sample made and then we had another video driving up to a gig and just, just tried to make the videos um, still interesting. I mean, they're there to try and remind people about the project, that's the fundamental goal, but in a way that's not blatant, you know, that's still something worth watching even if you are already involved. So we just, we tried to do it regularly, but not so much that people got sick of us. Great. Well, it looks like um, we're coming to the end of our time here. Um, as I've said, it's just been an amazing selection of tips and insights and really appreciate you, Anna and Vanessa, taking time out to share with our arts community here. Um, I know it has been a burning issue for people. Um, the tips have been invaluable. Um, the, a video of, of this presentation and a copy of the slides as per normal will be made available on the Creative New Zealand website within the next week and Sabrina will send you notification. I know I for sure will be going back to it to sort of pull out some of the key information. Um, so, you know, Anna and Vanessa, huge thank you to you both. Um, and um, we hope you all will join us for next month's webinar, which will be the sixth in the Optimise webinar series. And this one is, what does Pinterest offer arts organisations? This will be presented by um, Anna Connell, who's the online community manager at BNZ. Some of you know her from her previous role with Auckland Theatre Company. So she really knows the arts sector well, and she also um, is working all day long in online communities. So she'll be sharing with you tips about how you can use Pinterest and optimise it um, for your work. So that's on Wednesday the 26th of June at the same time. So pop that in your calendars, but you will receive notification from Sabrina. So without further ado, I'll, I'll close the webinar. Thank you everyone, have a wonderful day out there um, at the coal face um, of the art sector. And thanks again to our presenters and to Creative New Zealand. Thanks.